I, I think the I have some slides uh, that Ethan and I put together, which were actually the output of a work that we did to create a cure roadmap. Um, but just to give you some context, um, so my daughter, she is now eight years old, actually turned eight yesterday. Um, she was diagnosed with, uh, with SDS when she was just um, eight months old. Um, and really, I guess as, as a parent, um, I am uh, I'm not a scientist. I do not have uh, the credentials that Alok has. Um, I was uh, I started my career in banking. I left to join a tech startup called Last FM. I worked in BBC and Universal Music. Um, so I had lots of experience in the media space. Um, I set up a corporate venture arm for uh, Universal Music, which is how I started to learn about venture as a way to uh, fund new disruptive ideas. Um, and I guess it was the experience of um, my daughter's diagnosis uh, and navigating various health systems to get her the right care um, and, and then start to identify the academics that were interested in this space um, that gave me um, more conviction about actually using venture as, as one way to, to fund uh, lots of different innovation within the health space. But just on, on, on SDS, uh, taking a step back, it's an ultra rare disease. So there are about, um, we think between 1,500 and 2,000 patients worldwide with this condition. Um, it affects um, it affects multiple organs um, and is, is really, I guess, what you say, uh, it, it leads to neutropenia, it leads to pancreatic insufficiency um, and um, skeletal issues and uh, over time um, leads to leukemia in, in many cases. So the median age of survival is 41 years old, um, and really it's blood cancer um, and infection being the main cause of death. And approximately 30% of SDS patients go on to develop this blood cancer um, by the age of 30. And therefore, um, and there are no uh, root cause or root, there are no therapeutics that, that target the root cause of the disease. Um, and it's, a, it's an autosomal recessive um, disease where the SDS patient inherits the two mutated genes, one from, the, the, one from each parent. Um, and I guess the next thing to say is that um, on, in my journey, I think the first thing that I, that I did once you um, really just try to understand from your uh, from your own child's perspective, do they have the right care, and are we um, are we in the hospital? Which is, if you're in the hospital, you have to really just be focused on caring for your child in the hospital. If you're at home and things are stable, then you can actually start to connect with others and start to find the other um, like academics that are that are interested here. So. In her case, she has a multidisciplinary clinic at uh, Great Ormond Street. They're great. We see them every six months. They do regular blood tests um, and, um, and, and bone marrow biopsies um, as well. And, and they're great. Um, they, there is also, I, I guess I started a patient uh, community. So I started a charity, which is called SDS UK. But that is really focused on bringing the patients together and providing support to families. Um, what was the first and, and, and first foremost objective of the charity? And then, in terms of academics, uh, there are some phenomenal academics already working on SDS. So, in Cambridge here in the UK, there is um, a clinician and a hematolo uh, hematology focused uh, researcher called Professor Alan Warren. He's working on a small molecule approach, which is actually has actually received initial funding from Medici. So that's amazing. David Granger, who also collaborated with uh, with Ethan and I on the Cure Roadmap, um, he's he's making some good progress. There's also a, a base editing approach at Boston Children's Hospital. 
And they, I don't actually know the progress there. They have been much, much more um, secretive, I suppose. Um, but our, but I, it, I guess it's it's a, it's good to know that there are some really smart people that are developing drugs for for this condition. Um, but I guess what I was struck by, um, which is which leads me on to how. So Ollie actually reached out to me on LinkedIn, said I'm doing some work work on. Well, I am a cystic fibrosis patient, and we've done some really great work in, in venture philanthropy. And we got talking and I shared with him my frustration, which was that I was seeing that the academics were working in silos. There was very little sharing of data. Um, there was a reticence towards meeting in person. Um, a lot of the, um, and, I, and I think this is very, very, uh, um, it's very common in the rare disease space. And so um, Ollie put me in touch with Ethan uh, and um, I felt like um, a meeting of a kindred spirit, and I I really um, loved working with Ethan. He made me feel um, very able, and he gave a sense of independence to the community. And what was what was phenomenal was that the output of the work with Ethan. So Ethan is obviously a scientist; he's a journalist scientist. But what we were able to create was a um, a roadmap, which was a strategy or uh, how we would get from where we were uh, towards having multiple therapies in, in the hands of patients. And so um, obviously working alongside the existing academic programs, but then um, really thinking what can be what can be accelerated and what can be what can we do in addition to what's already being progressed. Um, should I pause there and hand over to you, Ethan, maybe, and you can talk about the work that we did. And obviously, um, Ethan, th this was the first roadmap that, I, that Perlara, per, Perlara did and has subsequently learned a lot uh, from doing dozens of these with other patient communities. Um, maybe that's a, a good starting, a good jumping off point, Ethan. Yeah, I mean, I think what we what we learned, uh, it's now clearly this this document could probably use a, a refresher, but I think the core core recommendations stand. I think, you know, we we put this document together with an idea of, of consensus building and wanting to get, you know, try to get basically unanimous buy in from from the SDS community writ large globally. And we kind of realized during that process that um, you know, that the community had some pre-existing, you know, fractures or pre-existing baggage, you know, let's say, and it, and it, would, it made it difficult for an entrepreneur like you to, to sort of plow ahead. Um, so that was definitely something we've learned and haven't been able to fix in subsequent roadmaps or subsequent projects, because that's just, that's something maybe Vibio and other DSI efforts can help fix, because I think the community, that part writ large, is um, is not trivial, um, and making it work, right, making everyone row together is not trivial. So I think that's something we should probably return to. But you know, we we put together a document where we tried to get the feedback from as many patient stakeholders, all the you know, um, you know, well, Professor Warren, all the all the the clear. Um, publicly known experts, publicly declared experts, and, and biotech folks like David Granger, we got all of them to get eyeballs on this document. And so, you know, it went through a process that is not unlike, I'm sure what McKinsey or BCG puts, you know, does when they put together a, a, a landscape analysis, let's say. But I think what we learned is that the plan seemed to be, you know, seemed to get kind of, you know, that, that the scientific plan, research plan seemed to get kind of universal buy-in, it was just sort of how to operationalize it, how to projectize it, maybe and we can come back to that. And some of the problem was the pre-existing fractures. Some of it was, you know, how do you get a community to fundraise around sort of nebulous things, things that don't directly, you know, benefit them like a like a biobank or other things that people will give their sample, but they in real time, short term, they don't see the payoff. Um, convincing people to fundraise for that is hard. Finding the right infrastructure, the right people to build that infrastructure with, that's hard. The current CROs and all that sort of cater to much bigger clientele. So yeah, there, we we put together this, this document, this landscape analysis, 
and, and in the process, I think started a, a community building spark that ended up, I think, you know, some of those fractures I was talking about, I think that that all kind of ended up um, being put behind, you know, in the rear view mirror for people. So they were able to work through that, but but I still it still left the question of how does this community fundraise? So again, that goes back to kind of hopefully what Vi Bio and um, and others in GSI are trying to, to to think about solving at scale. But you know, in our little test case, I think we checked all the boxes, and then where at least from my perspective, things kind of became you know um, became harder to translate from the document were, were around sort of you know how to get the community to fundraise, what what priorities to get them to fundraise around, um, and then yeah, how to deal with folks who whether it was on the academic side or the industry side, or sort of default secret mode and or default stealth mode and how, how to basically get them to really contribute. And uh, so, yeah, so I think we kind of exposed all the problem points and how I think DSI and, and groups like Vibao can come in and solve that um, because we receive these same problem points over and over again with all the groups we work with. Um, but yeah, I think we, there's still all the promise of, of the science that we scoped out. And if anything, I'm even more stoked for, for new technologies coming along, especially targeting the, the blood cell component of this disease. Um, but yeah, you know, even though there was that small company that was created that my, my Medici, it's, it's not like they sort of just magically solved problems. They, they came up that, you know, they ran into their own challenges. Right. And so I think, yeah, I'd love to, you know, stop talking here and open it up to others and uh, figure out how we can go back to to what we did and fig and kind of now reimagine a path forward with this Web three lens. So I think you know two questions maybe to sort of kick off this section of the discussion. One for Julia and one for Ethan. First, I think for Julia is, you know, you did a phenomenal job and obviously we're catalyzing a community and starting to, to bring more focus to this domain. But when you think about what success looks like, the the most near term kind of objective when you were starting out, how would you define that? Right. What were you trying to drive towards? That's sort of the first question for you. Um, I think the first uh, objective that I that I had was really one around um, around a unified vision um, and around collaboration uh, among the existing scientists, but also among the patient community. Um, yeah, I think that was the overarching objective. And obviously what winning looks like is, is having multiple thera therapies available for, the, for each child, um, yeah, the right therapy for each child and to enable um, every child to live a very long and, and, and successful and full, fulfilled life um, without the worry of 30% of them uh, going on to, to, yeah, to pass away from, from AML. And so, you know, Ethan, when you and Julia first met, so my second question is, you know, since you've seen a myriad of different uh, patient communities in a similar boat, what were the people that you wanted to bring around the table that you felt would be critical for Julia initially to <clears throat> achieve her first line objective as she headed down this journey? Yeah, I mean, first we had to do this capacity building, um, so build this infrastructure, and then we also had to try to get people to take responsibility for these tracks and for objectives on the track. So knowing that there was a small molecule focused company going after a particular disease modifying target that was pretty, pretty well validated, um, like that was, you know, that was, that was sort of like, Felt like a blessing oh great this this startup is going to take care of this but then i think as time went on it became clear that that, that startup is going to face all the challenges that every other little startup faces that that basically just has an asset at the end of the day that, that will either fail or succeed on their initial indication which is their best guess for what it would be useful for and so i think um yeah we definitely knew who the people were who uh who could carry out these tracks and execute i think yeah some of the challenges were more just how did how did how did it go from theory to practice, um, and and how much sort of power could be exerted uh, or influence could be exerted by say just one individual like like Julia, who in the end of the day sort of was this all kind of fell back on her shoulders, and so there was sort of this yeah this community building um, 
um, movement that was started, but then there was a lot of work to like, for example, even just getting <laughs> the community to like one of our objectives was let's just get everyone on on Slack or Discord. Even I remember even having the debates about which which platform to use. But then even just getting people to do that to just keep the keep keep the chatter going about the roadmap exercise because we put we had a convene we had a briefing at the community together and it was it felt like we were we could start to really snowball. <laughs> but then yeah, it just sort of at the end of the day, this all kind of fell to Julia and there wasn't really. A uh, set of co-founders around her, and because uh, it's not just it's community, you have to kind of really now be granular. What does this community look like? There's micro communities within there. There's there's the leaders. There's the influencers. There's so and that part, you know, again, that the 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 the, the beautiful theory of a community versus like the reality of of what what a what a quote unquote community looks like. And in, and in the case of SDS, there was baggage. There was there were now multiple players in the ecosystem that. Um, that really had to cooperate and there really weren't frameworks for them to do that other than just sheer will of, you know, sheer force of will by someone like a Julia or other figure to just keep, keep serve as a glue and keep everybody focused. And that's just, yeah, it's hard. It's really, really hard to pull off. And so other groups don't really pull it off. Yeah. And on that topic. So I think there certainly sounds like, you know, Julia is sort of the catalyst and the founder, right. Help really bring a lot of the initial pieces to the table. But, you know, there's, I think, our prior discussions, other additional expertise that's probably important that probably wasn't within Julia's sphere that you were able to help bring to the table, or uh, can you help you know, maybe get a more granular and specific on what some of those additional expertise might be, especially from a drug development standpoint? So I think for the broader audience, you know, we can go build a community, right, of patients, scientists, partners, but oftentimes the types of folks you need at the outset of a project versus at the next inflection point might be different, especially in biotech. So curious if you can give us maybe a little more granularity as to who the right personas or people were that you brought in incremental to who are already around the table. Yeah, I mean, I think in the case of SDS, we only got kind of got so far. So I, I think I can talk about maybe in other other groups we've worked with and we've gone a little bit farther, you know, built on the platform we built with SDS. So we, all, we, we kind of realized that the, the experts, as you said, that there will be a set of experts that exist already that are obvious and public to identify, but then there'd be this component of actually having to recruit people into your, um, you know, so it's not just about saying I needed this type of an expert. It's it's more just that you needed really brilliant people who were kind of tangential to what we were working on. So weren't directly working on SDS, but were kind of maybe doing something tangential and, and recruiting them and getting them passionate so, you know, doing those kinds of things, I think were, were definitely activities that, you know, I didn't personally push with SDS and with Julia, but that's something we've done. Subsequently, we could always go back and do that. I think in terms of other expertise that we, we would recommend, you know, a lot of the times we see that there was a, a key academic or some other researcher who just was like clearly seen as the person who knows the most about this gene or process. Having them on board is great, but then Kind of depending on them uh, at some point, it becomes sort of like this single node failure uh, issue, and you you don't want to just depend on one one person. Uh, and so, what we also realize is that you can take expertise, um, and you know you can separate that from where that expertise executes on those ideas. So instead of having it all bundled with the expert in their academic lab and having to fund all that, if we can kind of unbundle that um, and start to you know, pop up, uh, you know, have foundations and families pop up their own lab space and their own lab capacity, their own research, offer them research capacity, then that that could kind of now offer a, another path forward. So I'm not sure if I'm getting at the answer to your question, but those are ways that we were thinking about how you can expand the circle and actually, you know, in bringing people who weren't there at the beginning, uh, who have all the founding, you know, principles, but, you know, the people we need to really scale the enterprise. Yeah, I guess just to add the people who commented on on the roadmap. So obviously, Ethan was the author. We uh, in our patient community um, did uh, did some, but but actually, yes, it was Alan Warren, it was David Granger, and then it was Yale Weiss, at, um, who was at Ultragenics at the time and who'd been a big supporter um, as well. So those were, I guess, the the initial core team who bought into the idea of what was presented. And for those who don't know, Ultragenics is one of the premier sort of rare disease focused biotechs in the States. Um, very patient focused, very driven. And Yael, who now runs a, her own rare yeah. disease focused biotech, ran all of BD exactly. at, at uh, Ultragenics. And I don't think they have an SDS program, but 
She's just one of those really uh, open-minded, supportive individuals of the community, which I think supports, again, this further notion of bringing in experts who are both adjacent, as well as maybe have visibility downstream as part of that initial planning and execution process. Exactly. They, they were considering starting an SDS program, uh, did some initial work, but again, um, yeah, in a portfolio of diseases, um, they, they had others that were more attractive. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I think, you know, for the audience, you know, I think what we've done is definitely hopefully captured a lot of the patient perspective that Julie, I think, succinctly described, talked a little bit about some of the people and personalities, more personality than persona, especially when you deal with academics at the table that Ethan was able to capture. You know, I'd love to actually maybe hand it over to Katrina to talk a little bit about the funding perspective and, uh, you know, whether it's with SDS or well, the diseases at this stage, therapeutic approaches at this stage. How do you think about the capital and the funding sort of um, perspective in that lens? Yeah, so we work with a number of organizations very similar to, <laughs> to Julia's, um, and they are generally the, the ones who have a figurehead who is really driving it and, and or a lead academic who is really driving it, somebody who's really passionate about delivering for that patient population. And that often does mean that a lot of the responsibility lies on one person's shoulders, but it's very difficult, I think, for for patient organizations often, if you've got a sick child yeah. or you're sick yourself, actually just getting through the day is hard enough. Yeah. Not at least <laughs> trying to keep a job and run a charity at the same time. It's it's a huge responsibility. But so we often, um, you'll find that a charity corrals the scientists, convinces somebody to work in their space, um, and then they bring them to us. And then we can sit down with them and help them think through their development project yeah. and think about where they can get funding. Now we provide funding um, for, for translational projects, but we also work with other organizations that, um, that fund research. So you know, we can help you get MRC funding or you know, with other rare disease charities like Action Medical Research or GOSS Charity or you know, wherever might be the most appropriate route we can help to take things through to de-risk um, academic science and then start to talk to um, investors or pharma or whoever might be the next step forward for things. Um, but for quite a few of these ultra rares, it's really hard to see what the obvious route forward is. Um, and so at the moment, we're really exploring some interesting not-for-profit models um, and um, you know, other business models to see if we can find new ways to get these things through rather than just kind of the classic um, venture route, yeah. which is hard, if, particularly for those like single asset companies. Um, if you've got a single asset that's been driven by a particular charity, it's very hard to see how you bring that forward other than to try and you know, bring it together with other conditions and about exactly. a portfolio approach. Um, it, the, the business models are quite challenging. Um, the other thing that we try to do is just take as much risk out of projects as possible. So we've put infrastructure in place, as Ollie alluded to, to help um, in the gene therapy space to get um, GMP batches of uh, viral vectors manufactured, small batch sizes, not large batch sizes for market or for large scale trials, but just the small ones, just to get enough data in early clinical trials to get you traction with an investor. Um, <laughs> And, and provide toolkits and, you know, a bit like your roadmap, I think we've just recently put together a toolkit to help people, charities primarily, but also academics to take repurposed drugs forward um, and navigate the complexity of that landscape. You know, it's not as simple as showing that a drug works. You've got to, you know, take it beyond that in order to get it reimbursed and, and available to, um, to that patient population. Just a, a, sorry to jump in with a question. I'm curious, um, uh, let's say charities and families, people with rare diseases, um, how much of that early discussion? One of the questions I would have is, will, will, if this is successful and there's a therapeutic at the end of it, will I have, will I have access to it? Um, because they're like can be staggeringly expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and so, for instance, there's a drug recently has come out, um, not for a rare disease, but uncommon disease, um, a drug called Mavacamptin, um, which is for um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's awesome, um, but you cannot get it in the NHS unless you have like, you know, a certain levels of, uh, you know, a certain level of disease. Um, and there, there, there are numerous examples like that, of course, um, cancer and so on. So I'm, I'm wondering like how you think about that and you know, what, what guarantees get given. 
<laughs> Guarantees. <laughs> well, that's a tough one. I mean, this is a this is the real challenge, right? And we've seen this in, you know, in companies that have licensed um, IP in and taken projects forward, even taken things to market authorization and then dropped them for commercial reasons and not for lack of efficacy. And I think that the only thing worse than having no drug for your addition is to have a drug, know it works and not be able to access it. And that was one of the big drivers that helped, that led us to developing the repurposing toolkit because there's a repurposed drug out there that can treat your condition and there's you know, publications that are out there that show that it works. You need to be able to access that, right? And we need to find a way of navigating the system in order to get patients access to that. So that was the real driver for that piece. But there are no guarantees. And the other thing that we have on occasions had to do with charities is where they have licensed something into a biotech. And biotechs sometimes do this, and the venture people in the room are probably curling their toes, but they put port they, they pad their portfolios out, right? So you have one lead indication and then you have other programs that just kind of sit there in the background and no one's really pushing them forward. Um, and if you're if you're, you know, the science that you've licensed as an academic or you know your charity is funded is just sitting there in the background, that's unacceptable. And it's really hard to get that IP back out again, if you need to, or if you want to. It's all very well putting all the clawback clauses in when you license, but actually it's really hard. Um, it can be done, we have done it, but it's not easy. So, it, you know, there's no, there are no guarantees. You know, you, you get over a hurdle and you think you've had a great success, but that doesn't mean that you are going to get a re reimbursed drug. It's not. Uh, and maybe just like a comment just on what you're saying. It feels like a, a lot of what gets done every single time you have to kind of reinvent um, the solution. And that, that makes sense when you deal with people and communities. That can be complicated, but it, it's, yeah, it, it, I suspect you're thinking all the time about how you can scale what you do and make it more uh, predictable. Um, yeah, and I think that's it. That, that is it. We don't want to have to reinvent it every time. And we've worked with a number of charities who have reinvented it. But if we can pull some of that knowledge and put it together in things like roadmaps and toolkits, then at least there's somewhere for people to go and kind of access that. Um, but you know, there's thousands of diseases out there that have no treatments. And so we need, you know, we need to share as much knowledge as possible. Even in CF, which is generally regarded as a successful case, I think we, we, you know, it took 25 years to get to a therapy after the genes identified, and um, when it was approved, it took uh, years and a lot of effort. I went to speak at a select committee in Parliament. People went to the Senate to, um, you know, to Capitol Hill in the states. People uh, did a, a huge amount. Um, my friend Flaminia over there helped with that as well, but. And still, um, it's very expensive, and probably, probably a third of the people in the world who could benefit don't don't have access because of the cost. Um, ultimately, what it boils down to is when you're licensing to a biotech company, when you wanted to get it to market, because in my experience, academics and charities can't bring drugs to market. We funded a gene therapy study in the early 2000s to phase two, which was pretty amazing for a charity. Um, didn't go anywhere and it was overtaken by the small molecules, but there's some valuable knowledge came out of it. Um, and the way the CF Foundation works is that if, if a drug is approved, it'll get a share of success through a royalty entitlement, and then it would typically um, sell those future royalty rights and recycle the proceeds back into more research. So Vertex turns out to be, a, the modulator turns out to be a blockbuster. The foundation's monetized $4 billion out of that and is now recycling it into competitors to Vertex and more curative therapies. And so that's a sort of a long-term way of dealing with pricing. But I don't see how a, a charity can, when it's going to a, a drug developing company, biotech or a farm company, can have enough leverage to say, your bet's off. You know, you, you, here's, here's our IP, turn it into a drug. It'll take 10 years, hundreds of millions of dollars. And by the way, at the end, you can't charge more than X. You have to guarantee everyone can, it doesn't, I don't see how that's possible. I know I said a lot, but I, 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 did you, was the case that in that, in that example, the, the foundation acted in a way that was more entrepreneurial than some of the... Well, you could say the foundation is one of the most successful venture capitalists in the world because it invested a hundred million in that, well, as a community. Some of that was recycled from earlier success on drugs like tobramycin, 
<laughs> nose, by the way. So it was actually, it really did get the snowball rolling, as we'd like to say. And, you know, having, a, having that self-sustaining pipeline with multiple shots on goal is what really, because getting to a cure is a long-term thing. And, um, and so it was, um, it, was a good, it was a good success story, but obviously the Valet Adventure for Mankery <coughs> model is that that's reinvested into more research as opposed to something like impact investment, where it's a bit of a partly financial return, which investors take back and others. So it's, it's interesting for me to think about DSI, how that can change some of those incentives to make it easier um, for people to, more people to participate in success and um, particularly to get people working together, whereas at the moment, there's a lot of people doing bits and they need to show that they've done something so that they can raise the next piece of money. And we love open science, but I sort of think of DSI as open science with some incentives to help make it easier for people to work together. Well, it's, money's an interesting topic. Yeah. I'm hoping maybe Katrina, since you've seen sort of a measurable number of diseases for a disease area at this stage to get to the next inflection point or milestone that you articulated, can you give us I hope this is not uncouth here in England uh, to ask, but can you give us like an order of magnitude of sort of the level of investment or capital required to sort of achieve that, right? That you've sort of seen or even a range. Just it, close. It, yeah, it, it varies significantly depending on what type of technology you're talking about, what the population looks like. You know. For some of the repurposed drug trials where we get things through clinical trials on three to 500,000 pounds, but for most things that we are talking about taking through trials, you'll be in the millions. Um, uh, but yeah, it, it varies hugely depending on what you're talking about. I don't think you can say that, you know, you can't set a target for a charity unit to go out and like raise this. And I think it varies and the problems you come up against in, you know, translational medicine are different and variable and whatever however well you plan you will come up with a problem that nobody has ever come across before and, and so um that ability to you know think on your feet and come up with a plan b is going to be really important and so you think you can get to the next stage with a million pounds but actually you come across a massive problem that needs to be overcome and you need considerably more so it's not there is no one size fits all but we're talking at least hundreds of thousands at least hundreds of thousands Mostly most millions and mostly. Which I think is like a really important data point, especially for those those of us in DSI, because at the end of the day, I think the marker for whether a given DSI project is successful is being able to get to that next inflection point, right? So to truly have impact, right, the quantity of dollars deployed really needs to match the impact we want to have. Yes, although that not, is not necessarily judged by patient numbers, because I think you know it, it can cost as much to get a drug forward for six patients as 600. And so um, yeah, there's a, a challenge there. So maybe for the broader audience, I think this is a unique opportunity where you know, you've heard, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, two quick things. One, uh, what is your view on the role of micro grants being that, yeah, the average is like hundreds of thousands of dollars, and maybe as we saw, uh, you can do 120K, get 36 projects up, uh, have a lot of impact, almost win the X Prize. So, what is the role of micro grants? And then, second, uh, if DSI is super successful in 10 years, what do you think the role of the FDA is with some of these rare diseases, ultra rare, where you have 50 patients? And, like, you know, you've got to prove, uh, you know, there's not very much proof that there's a pushback for patients that exist. Yeah, that's just briefly, I mean, the FDA is getting a little bit better at working by analogy almost in my layman's sense and, and um, you sort of bridging rare mutations where they're similar enough to other mutations where there's a therapy. And, and um, you know, we benefited from that in CF where there's some really rare mutations, sort of long tail of very rare mutations. And I think in gene, thera gene therapy generally, there's, there's a lot of effort. Peter Marks and others have made comments about how to make it easier to um, almost sort of repurpose uh, data and knowledge and, and manufacturing techniques and quality control to sort of make it easier and more efficient. So people don't have to start from scratch all the time and take 10 years to do something where really you know the answer, but it's just, it's not in the right format. Yeah, I think that's true. I think the regulators have got a lot better with this stuff. I mean, there's room, there's room to go, but they have got a lot better and they're now considering things like N equals one studies, which um, I heard of a few years ago. So 
I think we are making progress. And as Ollie says, that, uh, certainly in the gene therapy space, there's an awful lot more agreement that you can look at, you know, not have it. You know, if you're just changing the gene, you don't necessarily have to redo absolutely all of the safety factors. So we are making progress in that. Everyone probably knows the, the, the um, Julia Vitarello story and Ethan uh, set up a really cool uh, forum on Clubhouse during COVID called um, Gene Fixers and Julia Vitarello, a, a daughter um, with a really rare disease and developed as kind of N of one customized ASO uh, in less than a year, I think, from first uh, uh, whole genome sequence to identify mutation and then um, through to an actual um, uh, drug that could be taken. And um, sadly for me, it didn't work out. It was a little bit too late, uh, but um, Julia is an enormous advocate for this sort of thing. And, I mean, Ethan in general's uh, kind of a, an N of one um, pioneer and, and now changing that to sort of one to many and how to scale up. So there's some really interesting stuff going on in that sort of space. So, you know, coming back to kind of the, the framework here, I think we've heard obviously from the patient community and their perspective, heard a little bit from a funding standpoint, at least at this phase, along with sort of an expertise uh, lens that Ethan's brought to the table. You know, I'd love to open it up maybe to the community, to the group here in the audience as to what are maybe some of the initial milestones that Julian and team should be thinking about in the stage that they're at? Um, you know, Ethan also would love to hear your perspective as well, since you were kind of boots on the ground, but you know, <clears throat> the situation that Julia is in is unfortunate situation that many patients and families are in. So what are some of the things that they should be working towards and what are some of the milestones they should be driving towards as they endeavor down this path? So, any thoughts on that? Hi. Um, so you hinted that you had some challenges in developing, for example, a biobank. And I think that that will actually be a massive milestone if you can bring together, you know, in these rare diseases, you really need to get global reach and essentially get, you know, a good proportion of the patients with these diseases into some sort of data set where they're happy for it to be analyzed. Because at that point, then not only is it used for observational studies and retrospective analyses, but actually it can be used as a platform to start recruiting your clinical trials. And that's where you can start exploding the efficiency of that phase three process. Um, some of the stuff we're doing in Oxford, so. Brilliant, thank you for that. So just um, on, on the registries, yes, there is there is actually an existing registry in the US, that, which is both clinical data and a tissue bank. Uh, in France, there is a, just a registry, so clinical data. Um, and in the UK, we've, um, we've submitted for ethics approval uh, earlier this year, both to create a clinical data registry as well, as well as a tissue bank. I think due to COVID, there was a massive backlog uh, in terms of getting ethics approval. And so we've been back and forth, back and forth. We've been told we were very, very close, but um, that's great to hear that you think that's a, like a value inflection point. And it's something that we've been like very, very focused on in the UK this year. And have you found challenges in getting these different national registries to collaborate into a global one? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, that's nigh impossible. Um, <laughs> as, but I think more from a data sharing perspective across borders, um, as opposed to anything else. And that's one, one aspect. The other aspect, I think, is that the clinicians um, or the own, I guess, the owners, uh, even though the patient owns, owns the data, the clinician feels that they own the data. And, and so I think they are very territorial in terms of both recruiting patients and, and uh, you know, um, really guarding the data that has already been captured. So there's been very little collaboration for, I guess, for those two reasons. Yeah, I mean, some of the things we work on are individual participant <laughs> data meta-analyses, where we take different randomized control trials in different areas combine them together into a single data set. It is a political operation, but when the will's there, I think it's possible. And with a disease like this, where I'm guessing that the patients have a real will for it to be looked into more than yes. at the moment, I think it could be possible. I think that's the, probably one of the, the the, the biggest things that the patients across the world actually agree on, that we would love there to be you know, a, a single data set uh, and one where researchers, anyone who's interested, we would love to have really smart people look at our data. We do not want there to be anyone who feels that they own the data more than, than we do. Yeah. 
And in Europe, there is the new European health data space, which I mean, it's the EU, right? But I think it will span some sort of uh, how to approach and how to support patients to have more power and more control on their own data and what they do want to do with it and how to reuse the primary data to support research and innovation. So it's really yeah. very high on the agenda at the moment. You know, that would be amazing if the UK could have been part of that. <laughs> no. But it, can we help? <laughs> Are the, I mean, there is the European Union, but then there are the associated countries that yes. inspired from it, and UK, certainly. You're not that really. far away. No, no, exactly, no. Great. The regulation in the data space is incredibly complicated, and it's something that we've worked quite closely with the Association of Medical Research Charities in the UK, <laughs> looking at how we can make it simpler, and that's not going to be easy. But there are now more and more groups and <coughs> companies um, coming forward where um, you know, patients can request their own data in most jurisdictions. And then if you, you can then give that data to other people who can analyze it, which is that I think the way around the, and I think these laws come from you know, good places. They want to protect people's data and stop it being misused. Okay. It comes from a good place, but actually the only way around that is actually to take the data to the individual patient and then give it to the people who think will analyse it in the right way. We tried to do that, didn't we, Ethan? So we requested um, all of the patient data from Great Ormond Street. And unfortunately, what I got back was a, a file of PDFs. There were 300 at odd pages of PDFs, which are obviously not um, interpretable. Um, and so what uh, but what I have what I have seen um, some there's a Polish company um, called something. Um, it's it's a DSI company that basically get the um, they get the right of attorney to request the data in the original uh, data form directly from the institutions. And to your point, they're re leveraging this EU law to um, to build up a data set, uh, which is, I mean, it's, it's very, very interesting. I think using DSI principles to to build, um, yeah, to, to build a decentralized data set that can be used to progress, uh, to progress research. So I think, um, but yeah, asking the patient to do it. That's what I thought we needed to do. Um, and we also tried to encourage Molecule to take a look at, at, um, at the PDF. And they said that is not our, we're not that interested. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think the challenge is, you know, we, everyone knows you need a biobank. Everyone knows you need a registry. Everyone knows it's a platform for clinical trials, but uh, there, 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 have, there has been an opportunity to really build that truly decentralized biobank, truly decentralized database that's really patient owned, that really is sort of peer to peer. And, you know, 20 years ago, we used to peer to peer file share MP3s because we were really motivated to share music. We don't seem to be as motivated to share data this way, but I think there are probably ways to build a decentralized sharing platform, peer-to-peer -peer network, where we can start to incentivize some of this and then build on top of that all kinds, you know, we had all kinds of cool ideas for NFT applications, you know, during the peak of 21. But I think things will come back, you know, people will come back to building because this idea is, is so key. If the community can all own together their own fractional piece of this database or this biobank, and then they can they can all kind of receive a future royalty stream you know, that would come from approval of this medicine one day in the future. I mean, that's the world where the utopia, I think we're all kind of building toward. But um, I, yeah, obviously we get there one tiny little step at a time. But even just this building of a biobank itself, we're not even talking about the physical part of this, which is like, you got to make sure you have multiple sites. You know, we have a biobank here in our lab in San Francisco. We had terrible rains. You know, I know you guys over there, like it's raining. Yeah, it, 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 it Rains. <laughs> so rains are a big deal in California, this, this amount. And it caused one of our freezers to go down. And like, so you have to think about that aspect of the biobank, which has nothing to do with DSI at all. It's just the practical reality of keeping some sample very cold. Um, and so I think we have to marry that kind of brutal, simple reality of, of a task like that with this, this great utopian vision of everybody being a fractional owner of their data and then communities sharing in the upside of, of drug development. Like we will get there but um, it's going to get it's going to it's going to take a lot of incremental evolution. 
Have you got a question? Um, I was just going to say exactly that, that I think sort of that this one's a bit outdated, isn't it? The sort of model of a company, um, you know, commercially develops a drug and then they need some patients to test it on. Um, or actually, we should be, instead of seeing what works for the drug, we should be looking at the patients and seeing what works for the patients. And if we decentralise that and have, you know, a group of patients um, that was, say, you know, accessible by an app and could be used you know, for those, those trial or given the opportunity to do that and they could self-enrol, that they didn't have to go via, you know, CRO or, um, you know, then actually we'd be doing what we, what's best for the patient and not what's best commercially, but you know, sort of flipping that around its head, it's best for everyone, it's best commercially and it's best for the patient. Um, and about sort of decentralising that, how do, you, how do you do that? How do you, you know, how are you part of your own conversation with healthcare, with science, with pharma? So yeah, I think it's really important about how we flip that around for the future. I guess what during COVID, when millions of people self-reported, that was not popular with the powers that be, not in any way whatsoever. They didn't get any funding, you know, because that's not how we do things. You know, if I can log on to my banking anywhere in the world, there's HSBC, and they're my data. I don't worry about anyone else having them, but I know the bank knows enough about me mm. to securitise them, to share them when I want them shared, etc. That exists. You know, and yet we're told you can't do that for health data? I don't think so. And the NHS is selling our data all over the world, so... You know, GDPR? Mm. So, I think working with disease is about, unfortunately, it's about cutting holes in fences. And it's, so the cleverness is like, which fences do you, which route are you going to take where you haven't got to have a pneumatic drill to sort of get through this stuff. And I know that we can, because there are fences, we can see them and they all irritate us and we can all sort of rage about that, you know, infinitely. I certainly can. Um, but I mean, it, it's how you can see what you can do in the system and work with it so that you can, you know, achieve your own objectives. And, and I think just it's, it's absolutely right within the rare disease space to be as selfish as you possibly can be for your objective because what you will do is you will create an ecosystem with other you know those other candidates will get you know moved along and people will learn a little more and there will be more funding academically and there will be more interest and then people will be able to pronounce your acronym and you know it, all of those things really really help so I think that we have to sort of draw, draw back and go, yeah, we can see everything that needs to be fixed here, but really selfishly, what was the shortest cut that I can find, what I want to do, and the funding that I can get, uh, and, and, and then the knock-on, I fully believe I've seen it happen, so I know, I know that I think we have to do that. Well, do you want to maybe just click click through the, the roadmap that you've produced? Um, we're, we're kind of coming kind of close to that. Um, well, I mean, actually, the, I, I mean, we can talk through it. And I don't think we need to look through the slides, but really the, 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 the year one was around exactly what you just highlighted. Um, it was around building a, a tissue bank, a registry, and actually creating um, a, a plan for how we would conduct a clinical trial um, uh, with if there were multiple therapies that were that were available and so working alongside Medici to to produce that um, and then and then subsequently we were going to develop um, other animal models that were not yet in existence um, and then and then further on from that uh, basically delve into other therapeutic areas um, and, but I think you're absolutely right to your point Katrina who who are the academics so there, there are they're very established and they are about to retire. So what I'm, uh, no, I'm serious. <laughs> They're in their 60s. And, and, um, and because there hasn't been a lot of sharing of information, my fear is that, they, that, they, that, that, the, that the knowledge just vanishes when they go. And so <laughs> we have a couple of years I believe of where where it's community building for the the next wave of um, of interested professionals who will be part and uh, along with us for the journey of developing the next wave of of, of therapeutics, um, and so that's something that I'm like. If anyone has any ideas of how to do that in a in a thoughtful way, I'm like really interested in learning how to do that. 
Um, yeah. Just, just to say, so I come from um, an oncology background, and oncology is obviously sort of commercially viable platform. You know, people go into it and they either stay in medicine or science, and or they go into pharma. And speaking to people in rare disease, I think that's a really big problem: nurturing talent in rare disease and getting people to to want to do it. Because as a you know, as a researcher, you're you, you know, your livelihood depends on where your grant's coming from, you know, your yes. mortgage and kids or, you know, the bills to pay. And so you want to know that there's a future and a commercially viable future, whether you're in the lab or whether you're in, you know, a company. And I think it's really important to get people interested, um, that know there's a pipeline for funding, know that there's not just money today for research, but there's money tomorrow and in five years, ten years, and that they've got a career in it. And I think it's really, I think that's a, a really big roadblock to developing talent in rare disease. I think that's absolutely true. And one of the things that I can't quite tell you yet that I've got it over the line, because I have a pitch going into my trustees mm -hmm. later this month for 40 million for translational rare disease centers with a big focus on careers and, but working in partnership with universities to support careers so that, you know, we don't want to fund a fellowship for three years and then have, them have that funding whipped away. Cause that's, that's, you know, there's a lot of fellowship schemes out there that yeah. support academics in the short term. We need this to be long term that if you can secure sufficient grant funding coming in, you actually get a permanent job. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to be a big part of that, how that money is invested. Hopefully. Yeah. And actually, I wanted to add uh, as an academic as well that often you're so dependent on the publication that you're going to get and your publication is dependent on the data that you manage to gather. So I imagine the, the unwillingness to share it is due to having the exclusivity and this reliable pipeline of publication coming funding. So we need grant without basis on publication, I think, for the future, in a way, or... I mean, there's been a lot of people talking about this for a long time, and, you know, the REF has had this conversation, you know, constantly. Every time it comes around again, they're talking about how we measure different types of impact. Um, and I think funders have moved, but, I, you know, there's a long way to go before we actually properly move most of the mm -hmm. established funders away from looking at publications. Or we just publish everything and just, yeah. you know, exactly. make it more. So also the sort of impact factor as well, that, you know, if you're publishing something in oncology, you're going to have a massive impact factor, you're going to get it into nature, you know, all the oncology journals have got massive impact factor. If you're publishing something on PCB, you know, interested, it's got really low impact factor, you know, it's like diamond, you know, no one's on this yes. So how do you show value, how do you show worth in the current funding model of impact factor and references? And how do you publish, you know, how do you get negative data out there better than we're doing now? Because that's really important as well. It is. And I think funding is going to change. I mean, you know, there are more funders like us who don't, look, you know, we don't look at what people have published. We look on, you know, is this science liberal? Have you got the right team? Right, not. Um, you know, what's your impact factor or your H index or whatever. Um, but it is going to take time to change those established boards. But, you know, a lot of there are, you know, there's a lot of that generation are retiring, and um, but we still see, you know, like you said in in COVID, there was a lot of resistance to doing things differently. <clears throat> it it takes time to move things and change things. Also, our editors view on you know, publication um, Are they, you know, are they open to publishing or do they you know, shy away from that? I've got a non-quality background as well. And, um, you know, yeah, they're, they're falling over themselves. You could get on. A whole range of editors, and you know all the great and the good PIs that you fund. But I just I don't know the rare disease so diseases. Is it is it easy? Because that again dictates you need that basic research out there um, from which you can build on. And um, it's just so certain indications it's, it's not easy. Is it? That's probably true. I mean, it depends where you're publishing, and you know I'm sure different journals will give you different views on that question. Um, I see things getting published easily where it is methodologies or, you know, technology that can apply to multiple different things. You know, that stuff is reasonably easy to get published. It's always, you know, tried and tested in a rare disease and then it can go wider that can get published. Or things that help you understand fundamental biology. It's going to be you know, answering one of those kind of fundamental questions that it, it publishers are keen to see it. If it's very niche and is simply about a very rare disease, I think it is harder to get it in. You can still get it out there. Um, you just maybe aren't going to get it in high and it may have this high impact factor journal. So 
So I think like the whole, a lot of the ethos and drive behind DSI is about getting rid of things like H-index and allowing you to um, um, get compensated for publishing negative data. It broken my heart to learn that, about the lack of reproducibility that exists within all of the scientific literature that I'd be going, oh, well, look, this could work, this could translate into my disease. It sounds great. And then you're like, you talk to someone in the back halls of some conference, and they're like, I tried that in my lab, I couldn't get that to work. And you're like, well, okay, cool, so publish that. They're like, nah. <laughs> Like, I'll just keep that in my back pocket. And you're like, so DSI is going to build incentives for that data. And the publishers of that data are going to own that data. And that data, if it's used to kind of demonstrate that something is not a useful methodology or technology to bring forward, it's really valuable. And that's what we're all trying to hear here, trying to build. And we're trying to make all of our different protocols and uh, systems interact and interface and be composable. That's, I think, the, the term that, that we've learned that is extremely powerful within the DeFi domain and allows you to create kind of constructs that if you wanted to build that within traditional science or um, finance, it would take you 10 million oh, in lawyer fees at five years just to build the contracts. And we can make that happen with like a few lines of code and it works. And that's what everyone within DSI wants to see happen. Or sorry, yeah, who, all of us who are building in DSI, we want to see that happen within scientific literature and scientific publishing and data sharing, etc. I think that's a really interesting point, and it's something that we're trying to do in in some areas. So at the moment, I'm working with a group in motor neuron disease, where trying to set up the same assay systems in multiple different labs so they can cross validate and actually, you know, give industry that confidence that that target has been validated in multiple different labs and got the same result to try and overcome that problem. There is a challenge there in getting funders to fund stuff that is just showing that somebody else, you can do the same stuff that somebody else can do. And so, you know, for an academic, convincing them that actually they want to spend a long time reproducing someone else's work is always a bit of a challenge <laughs> <laughs> because you're not going to get an interesting high impact paper out of it. Um, but it is important to do. And if, you know, if if industry are going to come and invest in something, they want to know that it works. You know. I mean, when I've spoken to, to funders, like charitable funders, I see my, you guys need to set aside 30, 40 percent of your budget to fund replication studies. And that's just the game. It's like we fund one lab and they get a result. We want to reproduce them again. And that needs to be embedded in the funders' psychology that X percent of our capital is going to be used to reproduce stuff. And then that that's like, it's not like it's thrown it away because academia is about training people, right? So you, you're still training people in the same techniques, the same technologies, the same methodologies. So you're actually getting the outputs that you want. Like a, a, that the people that are coming out of the academic training pipeline have the same capabilities. Now they understand from the get-go, reproduction is, reproducibility is, as important as the result, because the result is useless unless it's reproduced. So I think we just start from the. It's fantastic. I'm just. I'm, Ethan's going to sign off, so I'm just going to. I think we say say goodbye and um, thanks for joining us, Ethan. Thank you so much, Ethan. Thank 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 thanks, you. everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, should we, do you want to wrap yeah, it up? Yeah, um, please. Why don't you go? Yeah. Well, you might, I mean, I, I don't know if there's anything that um, people can take away about Vibe and how to maybe um, get involved with particular projects, but um, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll let you finish it off. But, um, yeah, thank, thanks to everyone for contributing to this and uh, sharing your ideas. And I think it's an exciting time, which we're all exploring. Um, but um, I think we all, we all see this as a really good kind of use case for some of these tools and platforms. Yeah. Um, and at the end of the day, there's 10,000 rare diseases, 400 treatments, and we need a better way of doing it. So uh, yeah. good to explore. So yeah, so look, I think today was a, the first time I think we tried this sort of new format. And you know, thanks very much to Julia for sort of pioneering this kind of new approach. Um, I think it's really opportune, especially here at the Crick, uh, you know, here in London, to try and bring together these disparate groups of patients, scientists, builders, and others. And hopefully we can start to iterate on this format and uh, try and use it again, hopefully for future events. Um, but look, I think at the end of the day, 
the pieces that I think Julia and Katrina and Ollie and Ethan and others have highlighted is that to truly realize the potential for DSI, you have to bring together aspects of not only the perspective and the objectives, but also expertise, capital and tooling to make it a reality. And I think they've done a phenomenal job in sort of highlighting what that means for SDS UK, but then also hopefully sort of setting a framework for how potentially other diseases and other DAOs could leverage that in their own circumstances. So I think I speak for the panel when I say thank you for joining us and, and sharing your thoughts and perspectives and hope we can sort of take these principles and experiences and translate them into our own projects in the future. So thank, thank you, you all. You.